Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session of today's call, you may press star followed by one to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now I'll turn the call over to Ryan Poulter. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Poulter and I'm with the U.S. Commercial Service Office in Connecticut. Thank you for joining us in today's webinar on export management uh, compliance procedures. A few housekeeping items. As with our previous webinars, we will have an audio Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can type it into the Q&A box on your screen at any point during the presentation. We will send a net replay of the presentation within 24 hours. Our webinar series will then resume in July. As we've learned um, in previous presentations, having an export management compliance uh, procedure is an important aspect of any company's export compliance strategy. So we're thankful to have our speaker here for today to speak and help guide us along the way. Uh, Gary Wilmarth, president of Wilmarth & Associates. Gary formed Wilmarth & Associates over 20 years ago. Prior to forming Wilmarth & Associates, Gary served in senior government compliance positions in the metal products, computer, aerospace industries, and directed the International Trade Consulting Division of several major U.S. law firms. Thanks for coming back today, Gary. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so let us proceed. Um, Before we get in, into the specifics of elements of an export control procedure, um, I thought it Im important to identify, uh, first of all, the reasons why, why do we, uh, why to implement an effective export control. Um, first, the, the obvious to everyone is that you want to ensure compliance with U.S. export laws and regulations and to satisfy inquiries made by U.S. export compliance agencies. Um, we all want to be good citizens. We all, all want to do the right thing, whether it's, it's uh, internally directed to do that or whether um, because our company, the, the, the assumption is that our company can have significant financial impact. Should we not control, we do it begrudgingly. For whatever reason, um, it... Uh, uh, you, for whatever reason, a company heads down the road to uh, implement and export controls. Uh, the real necessity is, is that the U.S. government, they're a US, you're a U.S. company operating in the United States, and therefore the expectation is that you have appropriate U.S. export controls. Um, it, and here again, the, the, uh, the type of export controls you have as, as, we, um, as we go through this, um, is really, really, really can be uh, um, in regards to the types of products and the types of business that you're conducting. Um, the second reason, um, the second reason is is a, of growing need to U.S. companies. Uh, in the past, uh, co U.S. companies were left to their own uh, to their own determination or own demise. Uh, with regards to export controls, and U.S. vendors and suppliers would buy parts from from a, a U.S. company, and the, their primary concern was that the products be uh, provided uh, in a cost-effective manner, competitively priced uh, to the quality standards of the company. Companies now are operating uh, with regards to their U.S. vendors and suppliers that those vendors and suppliers can impact their compliance, and therefore, uh, companies, U.S. companies now are requiring as part of first inspection, as part of vendor qualification, uh, that their U.S. vendor base, their U.S. suppliers also um, certify, verify, or, or illustrate to some degree um, that, that those vendors and suppliers that they're buying from are compliant with U.S. export laws and regulations. Although, uh, in other words, something more then they lock their back door and they lock their front door and they have sprinkler alarms so that if they all of a sudden need parts and components that they bought that they won't find that the vendor or supplier is burnt to the ground because they don't have a smoke alarm or a fire alarm or a sprinkler system. Um, and the third reason 
Uh, the third primary reason uh, that you have export controls is is you want to assure that you can mitigate any possibly any possible penalty or investigation when an export violation occurs or when an inquiry uh, takes place by a U.S. government agency. Um, even in the best of situations, and I will emphasize this as we as we move forward on this presentation. Even in the best of situations with the best of controls, companies have human beings that are working for them, employees that are conscientious, employees that are not conscientious, uh, employees that uh, have a high degree of intelligence, and employees who have a lesser degree of intelligence. Uh, and therefore, uh, any, uh, any activities carried on by a company that have export compliance um, um, obligations and requirements are be really beholding to their employees to adhere not only to the U.S. US government laws and regulations, but US, U.S. government laws and regulations as defined and stipulated in the company's export controls. And also, uh, it is important to note that by having policies and procedures in place, uh, policies and procedures can go a long ways, as I've mentioned, in mitigating any possible any possible penalty. Uh, the old uh, uh, the old uh, uh, retort that some companies that don't have in place controls can make to the U.S. government pretty much uh, pretty much results in in their, uh, their in stating that their current controls are in God we trust, uh, which which doesn't go a long ways in alleviating U.S. government concerns. Uh, and also can can significantly accelerate not the potential for financial penalty. Financial penalty oftentimes is not the real concern. The real concern is a long protracted uh, involvement with the U.S. government in the company's business, uh, but more specifically in the company's sales and shipments. Okay. Um, So we've talked about the reasons. What, what are the requirements? The requirements for export controls uh, that obviously are dictated by uh, by the U.S. government, but but also uh, to a large extent by by your U.S. by U.S. companies, uh, U.S. Uh, customers, um, and sometimes to a growing degree now, um, U.S. companies are often directed and or overseen. Uh, or, or through inquiry and demands by their foreign supplier base, foreign suppliers uh, and foreign customers are starting to be um, as, as concerned about a U.S. company's compliance with U.S. laws and regulations, under, understanding that it can impact they, a foreign company's status with the U.S. government or ability to have a viable supply of products uh, that they might be buying from, from a U.S. company. So um, it's 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 important um, uh, that a U.S. company have controls that direct uh, the uh, activities of of your company's U.S. Um, U.S. business and activities. Now, that direct the activities of your company's business with regards to those activities, functional activities, or or business activities that have a potential for export control. Um, you want to make sure in, in creating export controls that you don't try to overly uh, direct and control those activities within a company that really have no relevant uh, requirements or no potential involvement or exposure uh, to export con to, to non-export control requirements. Um, and then you also, obviously, first and foremost, you'll hear it time and again during this presentation, you want to ensure that you comply to U.S. export laws and regulations. Um, the third reason um, that you should have export controls or that you have the requirement for an export control are, are the expectations of U.S. government export compliance agencies. Now, sometimes, I realize this is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Commerce, but um, the U.S. government sometimes does um, impose um, and it, it ebbs and flows um, by having stipulated um, controls um, by in a company's export controls that really aren't relevant to the company's business 
aren't relevant to the actual business they're conducting or the potential business uh, they're conducting. Um, and some of those can, uh, some of those control requirements um, can be regards to brokering, um, which is which is an ITAR issue. If you have uh, U.S. persons um, out selling your ITAR products, they, that that an individual or that company has to register. Uh, so fairly broad, on a fairly broad brush basis, um, Director of Defense Trade Controls once a U.S. Co U.S. companies to to embed in their policies and procedures is our guide is guidance direction identification, but more so guidance and direction on uh, the requirement for a registration of uh, for a brokering registration of any any U.S. Uh, entity that's that that uh, involves themselves in selling your company's ITAR products. Um, also, kind of a new element on the block is. Um, U.S. <clears throat> excuse me. U.S. export compliance uh, compliance agencies now um, are more frequently, um, when when they're reviewing export policies and procedures, normally as part of a compliance case uh, that's associated with um, with the requirement for for a company to submit their export controls, is that there be a stated policy in the company's export controls. That that export compliance and control um, um, com that the that the individual that each individual employee of the company's uh, evaluating each individual employee of the company's compliance to U.S. export laws and regulations. Now that's a little ludicrous and impractical, and and um, and inconsequential for many functionary. Individual, many function, employees of many functionary groups within individual companies, but it is a new guy on the block, so to speak, uh, a demand being made by um, export compliance agencies where they want individual employees to be evaluated uh, at, their, at their time of their annual review on their compliance with U.S. export laws and regulations. Not talking in the negative too much, but um, it's in in a recent vintage um, years years ago, um, thirty years ago, forty years ago. Um, the, the primary the primary concern, the primary uh, uphill battle we were fighting with clients was with regards to a company's lack of having any export controls, and and um, and and. In, in, in getting them to entertain the idea of implementing appropriate comprehensive export controls. Um, now we're finding uh, companies, a number of companies have implemented export controls uh, based on a concern, based on a violation, uh, based on a, uh, a demand being made on a, on a large uh, U.S. customer of theirs um, for, for export controls. Um, and they're creating very unwieldy, unmanageable, and 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 lengthy controls that do more uh, that do more disadvantage to them having uh, appropriate controls and being able to appropriately direct the actions of their employees and, and them carrying out their daily uh, functional responsibilities. Um, we're finding what, what 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 you should not include in your export controls are detailed copies and restatement of ITAR EAR regulations. Um, make a clear statement within your export policies and procedures um, as as that these controls are 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 are, uh, are based on those export laws and regulations that that direct your U.S. export requirements, export control requirements, as contained in the International Traffic and Arms Regulations and Export Administration Regulations. And then cite where on the web, the, the specific 22 CFR of the ITAR, 
or where 15 CFR of the Export Administration regulations can be found. So that individual employees, should they wish to read in greater detail uh, specifics of these regulations, have an opportunity to be able to have ready access and knowledge of where, where those regulations are, uh, are located. Um, otherwise, you really do lose the forest from the trees uh, by, by, by creating and including major sections of the ITAR or the EAR. Um, what we're talking about today are policies, procedures, and controls, where this is not a training program. And that's the reason, that's the reason you also want to avoid providing training material in your uh, um, export controls. Um, providing training material in your export controls does not satisfy that line, that line item, that major line item of appropriateness of controls, which is providing sufficient training to employees with regards to uh, U.S. export laws and regulations and specific uh, training to the employee on the formal U.S. export licensing and control policies and procedures and technology control plan, which we'll be talking about, that, that your company has put in place and how those relate to that individual employee carrying out their functional responsibilities uh, on behalf of the company on a daily basis and also giving them general knowledge of those other functionary, those other functional groups, departments, uh, um, involvement of, of other individual employees within your company and having a good access to knowledge uh, um, as to how those employees comport themselves with regards to compliance to U.S. export laws and regulations. Okay, um, and, and to continue, continue forward here too, um, these are our, these are general export your your export policies and procedures are a company wide export licensing and control policies and procedures um, that go across all spectrums of the company's business and all the functional activities within the business. Um, obviously, with with more applicability to certain activities by individual employees. But, but it should provide to every employee every need, every, uh, every directive, all the actions of, of, of the company to ensure that technical data, product technical assistance, or any other involvement that would result in an exposure of the company uh, to noncompliance to U.S. export laws and regulations, and more importantly, ensure that they comply with U.S. export laws and regulations are specifically directed and, and uh, detailed in the export policies and procedures. Um, export registration, license application completion, classification rulings, and other how-to detailed elements that are supportive elements um, of, of, ex, of the export licensing function um, or related to export compliance should not be included in a policy and procedure. Um, those are, those are you know, areas of involvement that require a fairly detailed level of expertise and know-how. And if the, if, the, if the company's export control department or contracts department or whatever department or group the export compliance and control function resides, uh, that individual department should they elect to do so to provide some standards to how they do things, which is which is advisable, should have a separate manual that details on how they complete applications, how classification rulings are completed, and whatnot, but not in the company's export compliance and control manual. Also, your policy and procedure when you do create it um, or when you revise it. Um, you should avoid you should avoid the temptation to include other U.S. government related controls in your policy and procedure. It's hard enough, difficult enough, and 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 you you will encounter moaning and groaning by countless employees uh, that they can't find something within your export controls, 
or they don't understand or they don't have time to look at it um, and or it's too detailed for them to spend time on it they have a shipment to make they have a customer inquiry that's 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 come their way uh, they're, they were overseas operating, trying to sell your products, and they didn't have time to access the manual. You need to take away as much of that moaning and groaning as possible, in all honesty, um, and make sure that your manual addresses what it is specifically identified as being. It's, 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 it should be a U.S. export licensing and compliance control manual. It's got policies, and it has specific procedures. Don't include government procurement. Uh, don't, in, don't include other uh, U.S. government requirements uh, activities in it. Have separate ones for those or include, include those with other smaller, uh, shorter uh, directives uh, that could be in other, other ele elements of your company's control regime. On a more positive note, um, what, what, what should your export, con what are the needs uh, of export controls by your company? Um, here again, it should direct and control all company existing and planned activities and business. Um, and those are with regards, those are regard with regards to um, export compliance exposure here again. Uh, enable prompt revisions and amendments to your policies and procedures. Uh, the worst thing to do is um, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the organization is of your company, however large they are, however they structured they are, it's important that these procedures, as best you can within the confines of a very structured company, of a very structured company requirements, is to avoid having to have protracted approval processes to amend your policies and procedures. U.S. export laws and regulations are constantly changing. Um, the, your business arrangement, uh, the way individual functional groups perform, uh, acronym names, methods for billing, uh, methods for order entry, order processing, uh, ERP systems and whatnot are constantly changing. You need to be able to make revisions to your policies and procedures on a real-time basis and then, and then get those policies and procedures issued to employees, to all employees, so that they can carry forward um, uh, performing their functions within your company in compliance with U.S. export laws and regulations. Um, do not make your export compliance and control policies and procedures part of your ISO. Um, it does not have to be part of the ISO. Uh, some ISO licensing people may tell you it is. Um, it's, it has stopped uh, since ISO has been around 25 years. Um, it, they've, uh, most, most of the certifying people um, are very understanding that it's part of an administrative function uh, that is not direct, direct, directly related to QC, direct, directly related to, to other functional activities of a product's quality, uh, but that they're part of general administrative activities. They do not have to be made part of your ISO process. In so doing, obviously, you're causing a protracted, um, a, a protracted period for approval. Um, you should make sure that your policies and procedures are valid based on current, uh, you know, the current business of your company and the functional operations of your company, and here again, U.S. laws and regulations. Um, you also should make sure that your policies and procedures are implemented and comply with not only U.S. export laws and regulations, but on implementation that that your policy that that the actions of your individual employees comply with your stated policies so you have two compliance needs with implementation of export controls one is us export laws and regulations and one is that the comp that the individual employees comply with your policies and procedures now even if those policies and procedures 
might not be viewed as by even by the U.S. government as necessary or overly cumbersome or whatnot, you will be judged by any U.S. government compliance agency that will audit you that that individual employees are complying to the detailed specifics that are stated in your export controls. So here again, make sure the export controls are necessary, are necessary to ensure compliance with U.S. export laws and regulations, or are necessary for inclusion based upon uh, directed or, or believed uh, needed uh, requirements by U.S. export compliance agency. Here again, if it's part of a compliance case settlement, uh, sometimes there are less than credible reasons for some of the controls, but but um, export compliance officers sometimes can stipulate things that uh, do do not do a lot of value added to your moving forward in a compliant way. Uh, but what's the old adage to get along? You go along, but make sure make sure that you're complying with everything that's in your policy and procedure. Um, Okay, so the export controls of, of your company should consist of two major documents. Um, it, they all tie together as one major document. Um, you should have, and I, I keep referring to export control policies and procedures. Policies and procedures are an old term. Uh, we oftentimes hear companies, I've seen companies of late put out policies and procedures that say um, export control roadmap. Um, and, and or export control or international trade uh, international trade compliance manual. Um, we're talking about U.S. export controls, um, and therefore, whatever you call it, um, it should it should clearly stipulate that these are export controls. Um, some um, I would avoid the cute or the or, or the less or the abstract term in in what you're calling your policies and procedures. And in fact, that, that's what they are. They are stated policies by your company, and they are specific detailed procedures on how the policies will be carried out. And the company policies should be based on, on the policy that will elicit the company's compliance with U.S. export laws and regulation. Um, the export uh, policies and procedures also should be supplemented by um, and it's usually done as an attachment, as an annex, um, a technology control plan. Now, as we progress here, um, I'll go in with the, what are the specific elements of a export control policies and procedures and also the technology control plan. But at this juncture in time, it's important to explain that a technology control plan, um, a, lot of the tech, a lot of the technical data, technology controls, um, will be inclusive in the export policies and procedures. Uh, um, the, the norm is to put it as a separate chapter. Um, and the technology control plan, there's some redundancy on those elements, many of those elements of technical data control that are also included in the technology control plan. So, so let, let, let's, let's jump to the actual reason. Why a technology control plan is maintained as a separate document is that when you have foreign national employees um, and you want to obtain licensing authority for foreign national employees um, and there's other reasons and licensing authority that would be sought, primarily from uh, the State Department Director of Defense Trade Controls with ITAR, USML items and technology, uh, but also from BIS uh, under the Export Administration regulations, there is a requirement that a company in submitting licensing authority for foreign national employees or, or other activities uh, be required to produce, and sometimes a partner in that demand is also Department of Defense, that the company uh, produce and supply to them as part of the application or, or as a basis and a requirement with their approval of the license, a copy of the company's technology control plan. You're better served having it as a separate document. It's like anything else that you submit to the government or or, or any external organization. Uh, the shorter it is, the better it is. All they care about is how do you, and a technology control plan controls the internal workings of your company. 
uh, any anything that goes into your or uh, into your facilities and anything that moves out of your facilities and the internal management of technical data information and and employees now primarily the focus is on visitors uh, and foreign um, uh, US visitors foreign visitors and foreign national employees so the the major focus here again is on individuals that flit about the the internal in, internally within your organization here and here again employees foreign national employees and and visitors uh, especially foreign national visitors and how you direct and control them uh the structure of the of the of export controls um uh first and foremost um since most companies uh, their existence is based on on uh, um, selling items, selling technology, services to U.S. and foreign uh, individuals and companies. So it's important that you have a product commodity export control procedure um, that works through the system of of dealing with uh, dealing with uh, receipt. Uh, consideration, acceptance, processing, approval, um, uh, provisioning, uh, manufacture, creation of, of, of technical information, formulating a plan to provide a service uh, to a U.S. company or to a foreign company. Uh, and with regards to export considerations, where there is a foreign party involved in this potential sale of a service and or a product. Now we're talking about products specifically here, uh, but there is a technical data element to it. Uh, with product sales on order inquiry, it's important that you have a system, uh, a system to uh, control and direct inside sales or external sales and marketing people in them making a sales presentation to a company. Um, if your company is just a build-to-print house, um, or if your company actually receives orders where you, where your company is relegated or expected or looked to, to do the individual design of the part and make a quotation and a proposal back to the foreign party. So, if when you're dealing with a controlled product, the control element on the product is not to control only the export shipment of that controlled product, but it's the front end involvement of your sale uh, up to the point where you're selling that product or in, in the aftermath, supporting that product down the road. There are certainly a number of technical data uh, con compliance control considerations that have to be made. One is, the, one is the proposal, the initial response back to a company, uh, if it's a foreign company, um, and, 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 how, and how that is directed, um, usually through an inside sales group, but also through other, others within your organization, engineering and whatnot. Um, so once the sale is made and those technical, those technical data elements are considered, dismissed, or provided for, um, and, the, and the sale is made, um, and the order acceptance is made, um, it's extremely important, as with any shipment, whether it's controlled or uncontrolled product, um, that is part of the order acceptance, and or at least prior to shipment, that you have end use and end user certification. It doesn't matter if you're selling automobile parts. Um, you should get confirmation from the customer, um, at least at least the negative statement if it's an uncontrolled part, or a a, a more detailed statement. Uh, in many cases, the detailed statement would uh, takes care of itself because if you've got to get a specific license from the Commerce Department to the State Department, you'll need a letter of intent, you'll need an MOU, you'll need a contract, or you'll need a combination of all those to support the application. But lacking the requirement for licensing authority, you'll need and you should have end use and end user certification. At least the negative statement which says, uh, because the only restriction for uncontrolled product is Cuba, Iran, Syria, Sudan, and North Korea, um, and also U.S. sanctioned uh, companies and individuals, U.S. sanctioned parties' participation. So at the least, 
you need from that auto parts uh, uh, foreign company that's buying auto parts from you, uncontrolled auto parts, you need certification from them that these parts will not be resold by them to U.S. sanctioned and boycotted countries or, or, or individuals. Um, and there are, there, are, there are forms, there's a negative statement form uh, that is available that can be submitted uh, and obtained from and garnered from them. Now here again, the short step that companies try to make is they try to embed it in their terms and conditions of sale. This is the uh, end use and end user certification is not a statement, is not a statement that is, or, or is not a condition that has to be supplied by you, the U.S. company, to the foreign purchaser. It's a guarantee, it's certification, it's validation uh, that has to be made by the U.S. person, by the foreign company, to you, the seller, uh, and, it, and that should be obtained. So, so now you have the sale, and you've, you've made the export sale. And here again, the, I should have mentioned, sometimes there's technical support, especially if it's not an expendable item, if it's a high-ticket item. When you sell product to a customer, uh, sometimes with it, they're also asking for um, additional technical data associated with it, uh, just not a top-level drawing or confirming specs. They might want your Q quality control uh, acceptance test report. Sometimes they want to know your acceptance test procedure. Uh, they want to dig down a little deeper in your manufacture of that part uh, than, than, than is normal or than is ex accepted. So in those cases, you really need to scrutinize follow-on technical support from the customer. Um, if it's controlled and you have a license, um, there's, you, you, you've handled that requirement, um, but you haven't met you may not have met the requirement for those follow-on technical data support requirements, such as a quality control uh, acceptance test report, or lo and behold, their requirement to provide you with an acceptance test procedure. Um, and, and those, in some cases, require a special, special licensing authority from the licensing agency. Uh, purchasing vendor and supplier and subcontractors um, why, why is that necessary? Why is that required? Well, um, it, it's understandable if it's from a foreign, if you're going to buy something from a foreign supplier, um, it's necessary that you consider uh, the RFQ or the RFP you're sending to that foreign supplier, the drawings you're giving them. Uh, but first and foremost, you've got to consider what are you buying from, from the foreign supplier. If it's a COTS item, if it's a, if it's a general hardware catalog item, um, um, the, the determination needs to be made in all cases, um, what's the U.S. jurisdiction and classification of the item? Um, if it's just a general hardware item, then you can go ahead and buy it, uh, implementing whatever internal controls that you have uh, for your materials or purchasing department purchase. Um, but it's important, uh, it's important if it is export controlled uh, and that the item that you're buying is export controlled in order to give them the drawings to assist them in a build to print effort of that part uh, that you get export licensing authority for that. Now that's usually understood by most U.S. companies. What's not understood is the interplay that's necessary with U.S. suppliers uh, with regards to U.S. export compliance control. Now if, if your company is dealing with uncontrolled product there's a minimal amount of interplay. There's a minimal amount of guarantee, certification, or validation that you need in your procurement from U.S. suppliers of product. Um, but, but if you are dealing uh, with a U.S. supplier providing parts to you for a controlled item, a U.S. supplier providing a service to you, uh, they do shut pinging, they do annealing, they do heat treatment, they do welding, they do validation testing, they do... And they do destruction testing, um, whatever they do as far as either supplying parts and components, um, doing an advance in value of an item, or doing um, rudimentary testing or detailed testing and support. It's important from that U.S. supplier um, that if, 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 if controlled product is involved or their support of controlled product that your company is assembling, producing, or designing, 
that you obtain certification from the supplier that they will comply with U.S. export laws and regulations um, and, uh, and, and some additional details within it and that the supplier on an annual basis provide you with that certification. Now, they're a U.S. company. Um, you're not their master. They're an independent company, assuming they're not in, on any U.S. government sanctioning lists, uh, that they're in good standing with the U.S. government. Um, you're, you're not your brother's keeper, but you do need to have them certify to you that they will comply with U.S. laws and regulations. You need to provide them with advance notice uh, that your company is engaged in the production, design, whatever, of controlled product, uh, and that and and that that it is it is intent it is in the intent uh, intent of your company to provide to them re RFQs or RFPs in their support in manufacture development um, what, whatever whatever the cause whatever the need is whatever really fits the scope of what your vendors and suppliers provide to you in in the, in the case of services or material. Um, and that prior to sending any RFQ or RFP to them, which would include drawings uh, and requirements information, that you need this advanced certification. So you don't get it after you ship something to them. You, you, you get that in advance of agreeing to, to carry on business with them, um, and, and you do supplier certification. Uh, you do supplier certification of their company. Um, also, in the terms and conditions of purchase when you're buying from a company, especially even if you, if you even if you're sending something to somebody um, and they're going to make, say, a metal rail, uh, you're not sending you're sending a drawing to them, and they're going to make a metal rail or or some type of minor part that goes on to an item that's a controlled part for you, and therefore that is uh, a controlled part. When you send and issue that order to them. They've, they've provided certification that they're going to comply with U.S. laws and regulations. You've identified to them when you deliver the RFQ or the RFP to them or the part to them uh, that, that, that it is a controlled part. So you identify that your, some of your parts are controlled. Now you also you've identified to them, you've also identified to them that you'll identify when you send them an RFQ or an RFP or you ship controlled items to them for processing, heat treatment, or whatever, that they are controlled parts. So you've done everything you possibly can do. But it's also important in the terms and conditions that you have with that company that that relegates them to providing that service or manufacturing that part for you at a U.S. location. Um, the worst thing in the world, and we have had countless compliance cases, where a U.S. company buys uh, a component, um, say a, an aluminum extrusion, and they buy it from a company in New Haven, Connecticut, and lo and behold, when they get those um, uh, aluminum extrusions shipped to them, they come from that New Haven, Connecticut's subcontractor who is in the People's Republic of China. So it's important that you stipulate in your terms and conditions that you're buying parts from them and that the parts to be purchased by them must be manufactured the facility as stated on your purchase order. Uh, there's also a, a QC requirement for that too, but uh, that should not be overlooked. Uh, technical data, uh, it's important in your policy and procedure that you, you stipulate, and here again, um, the, and with, with technical data control, it's extremely important through employee training uh, and reinforcement through detailed policies and procedures that you identify what the obligation is of an employee to do self-certification, self-validation, um, but, but, but more importantly, self-determination on certain levels of technical data that might be that might they might be exposed to, or they might have to make decisions on, and also identify under what parameters they are not allowed to make their own decision on the transfer of technical data in a phone call, in an attached email, in a foreign visit, or their visit or visit in a foreign country. Um, and that includes shipment by courier service, hand carrying, phone, fax, email, foreign travel, uh, visits to U.S. companies. Uh, we're going to be running short of time here, so I won't identify that. Uh, but just as an example, say a, 
an employee of yours visits somebody with ITT in Baltimore, they go to Baltimore, Maryland, to ITT's facility, and lo and behold, ITT has one of their Singapore, ITT Singapore employees there who's a, who's a Singaporean citizen, and you start talking about detailed uh, information relative to the component that you're manufacturing for ITT. Um, you, as an employee of your company, is responsible for compliance with U.S. export laws and regulations, not ITT. It's in the confines of the facility. They are not responsible what you have legally exported or what you have illegally exported to their foreign national employee in Singapore. Not fair, but that's the, that's the truth. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, there's ways of being reasonable, realistic. Um, and here again, we're not going to have time to delve into that, but there should be some instructions with regards to your employees when they visit a U.S. company and there are, there are identified foreign nationals uh, in attendance. Uh, U.S. technical data presentations to trade shows in the U.S. Uh, here again, visitors. Uh, visitors is a, is a big area of concern. Um, it's important that your visitor policies and procedures uh, are reasonable, realistic, and and meet U.S. Law, U.S. export laws and regulations. Um, the requirement to require every visitors to visitor to show you a passport. Um, this might be disputed by some of the attendees here, um, but requiring that they show you a driver's license uh, is is of little value. Um, last count, I think there were 16 states that now issue. Uh, driver's licenses with U.S. addresses to foreign nationals. So a, a, um, a, uh, a U.S. driver's license does not denote that somebody is a U.S. person. Um, and requiring everybody uh, produce a passport is, uh, is unreasonable. Um, if you have classified programs, uh, there's a different hierarchical requirement. Uh, foreign national employees, uh, controls for foreign national employees as they work within your organization. Um, we have found and have recommended and provide for most of our clients if they have a foreign national employee. Uh, it's a big facility with their own cafeteria, and they have a foreign national employee working in the cafeteria that is, is uniquely a cafeteria employee. We will obtain an export license, and, 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 and the company, the client, has export control technical data and manufacturing activities carried out, we will get a license for that foreign national employee and all foreign national employees within the company. It's much cheaper, it's easier to manage, and it's much more saleable on year two, three, four, and on when those employees are employed and, and working within your facility with regards to your compliance with U.S. export laws and regulation by having appropriate licenses for those employees versus making a long explanation that the worker who works in the cafeteria has no access to um, uh, controlled technical data or product, doesn't work through the factory to go to the ladies' room, uh, in inclement weather doesn't access her car through the factory or whatever. It's just easier to get foreign national uh, licenses for, uh, for, all, uh, for all foreign national employees, and it's doable. It's, it's in a, in a kind of an incidental access license. Uh, temporary employees, it's important that you uh, identify temporary employees. If it's through an employment agency, it's important that you have certification from the employment agency, especially if you deal with controlled product. You need certification from them that they will only send uh, to your company uh, because you do deal with controlled product and controlled technical data, uh, that it's only feasible for you to have in your facility and for them to send on a temporary basis um, uh, temporary employees that are U.S. persons. And also, it's, it's extremely important in order to have all these controls, uh, the technical data controls manageable, in that all the technical data that you receive from vendors, suppliers, or the technical data that you create as a company clearly identify at least on the top page if it's a multi-part uh, technical data package, uh, but on individual drawings as well, um, the, uh, the marking of the technical data with regards to a specific U.S. export jurisdiction and classification. Uh, the mere standard statement that this technical data may be 
controlled by the U.S. Department of Commerce under the uh, Export Administration Regulations or controlled uh, by the U.S. Department of State under the International Traffic and Arms Regulations is not acceptable and provides no correction. Gary, we have a question that's related to this slide. Speaking okay. of technical data, is all is that all technical data or just regulated technical data? Would you give some examples? Um, I, I my my recommendation is is that all technical data should be stated in the affirmative. People make mistakes, so it does the omission of any technical data control statement mean that it's not controlled, or does the omission of a technical data statement mean that, uh, um, it, I forgot where I was at, whether it's controlled or not. So yeah, no, the technical, and, and by uncontrolled technical data, we're talking primarily uh, Commerce Department, civil commercial uh, technical data that might be EAR 99 or equivalent control. Um, my recommendation would be placed on all. So, so really all technical data is controlled to some degree within, 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 within regards to commerce. So I would apply a technical data uh, stamp designation um, uh, watermark um, on all te on all technical data, um, and then it can be handled uniquely uh, based upon what the what the actual technical data. It's an uncontrolled item, um, but but the the uh, technical data uh, designation should be at all. And, and was, was there a part two to that, or? No, that was all the question. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Um, so uh, export documentation. So you've got your order. It's been accepted. Um, whomever creates the commercial invoice, I realize sometimes commercial invoice is created by the accounting department, and then it's called out by the uh, it's called out by the shipping department, and they print it. Uh, sometimes it's hand delivered by uh, by the accounting department or some administrative person down to the down to the shipping department. However, it's created. Um, every export shipment should have an accompanying uh, commercial invoice, uh, along with a commercial invoice. If it's FedEx, UPS, UPS or DHL, you're creating the own your own export bill of lading. Um, at your facility, at your company's facility, obviously you need to keep a copy of that. Is if you don't and you do it on a shipper's letter of instruction and you ship by expediters or shanker or some other quote unquote traditional freight forwarder, that bill, the actual export bill of lading is created by them once it goes to their individual station at JFK, LAX, Miami International, wherever, whatever whatever port of export it's going out, it's, it's important that you capture that too um, because it, we'll, we'll be talking shortly here on the next uh, level about record keeping. So the export bill of lading uh, needs to be re retained. Also, if your shipment is uncontrolled, if it is automobile, automobile parts only, if it's over $2,500, it has to go through the new automated shipper's export declaration submitted online through Census Bureau system the EEI, Electronic Export Information, uh, the AES system, um, and, and, and that actual printout should be kept. Now here again, it is extremely important, not just important, it is required that you have a copy of however you want to term it as the print screen or the actual AES Shippers Export Declaration screen that was submitted to the U.S. Department of Commerce that was approved, and with approval, there is an ITM. That's the that's the that's the. It's okay to export the shipment based upon computer modeling and, and information. That you maintain a copy of the actual shippers export declaration, automated export system, electronic export information uh, screen uh, with your export with your export documentation for export controlled shipments. Now, it's it, within the laws and regulations, if you read the export administration regulations, the EEI, AES should be kept for all export shipments. But if you have a shipment that is EAR 99 or equivalent, uh, the ITN number noted on the shipper's export bill of lading 
or write it on, on the, uh, the applicable commercial invoice um, is acceptable and it has been acceptable by export compliance agencies if it's not controlled. Not controlled meaning EAR 99 or equivalent. And oftentimes a lot of companies sell product over the internet and they make hundreds of thousands of shipments. It's implausible, it's impractical, and it's really not necessary on those uncontrolled export shipments that they have an actual print screen of the AES. Sometimes AES is not submitted, so you, so you wouldn't have to have it, but if it's over $2,500, it's, it is issued. It's really not necessary. Just write the ITN number on it. Here again, focus on the important things. Comply with the important things. Set up standards and, and a line in the sand for doing those things that are really necessary, prudent, and also, you know, the age old saying, to get along, you go along. You want your system to look like other companies who are compliant and have had their heads screwed on straight that are compliant with U.S. export laws and regulations. You don't want to pat yourself on the head by saying, my system is the best system in the world. It's, it's better than anybody else's. There's a cost to that. Uh, there's a cost to that, and oftentimes it's not the best system in the world because it creates so much confusion, so much rancor within your organization uh, that people tend to not comply with it. Um, and, and here again, there's an unnecessary ex excessive amount of cost. And here again, I'm taking this mid-juncture point to tell you that even with the best of export controls, with the best intention of all of your employees, violations do occur. Errors are, are, are made. Major or just administrative errors are made. So even in the best of situations, even with, with the, the, the craziest of controls, human beings work for your company and human beings can make mistakes. So it's, I, I, I'm a compliance guy, but I'm, I'm a practical person and can say that, the, that having the best of controls that you could ever have only add cost. They don't reduce uh, exposure or risk for violation. Okay, get off my soapbox. Okay, so we talked about record keeping. You need to keep your records for a five-year period from the date of export or five years from the date of the expiration of the license that the product was exported, which means nine years. So either you have a five-year period or a nine-year period. Maintain extra, maintain separate export documentation files. Um, if you're in the aerospace industry, you have, uh, you have safety of flight issues. If it's another industry, you have, you have quality control, you have product liability requirements, you have tax requirements, sometimes nine years, um, all different requirements based upon all different government agencies, all different business needs. Keep separate export control documents. Now those documents might be embedded or might find their way into other functionary uh, files within your organization, product support, engineering, uh, accounting, and whatever else. But identify in a filing cabin or a record um, or the, wherever you keep your records, that these are your export control files. Um, and then on day one of year six or on day one of year 10, um, you destroy those records, not to cover mistakes that you, are, that you make, but when the infamous error is made in the best of situations and, and um, OEE or, or defense trade control compliance or customs agents come in to visit, they only have that five, those five years or nine years worth of records as applicable to look at. They don't have 35 years of records to look at. And lo and behold, at the conclusion of them spending the whole summer at your facility, because you have 25 years of records, they find nothing, only that one error that you made that was the basis for them coming in. So keep, keep separate records. Um, um, and miscellaneous controls, it's, it's, it's necessary here again, I had said on brokering, identify brokering um, in the thing. Um, it's, it's a requirement to get along, you go along. Um, there should be some statement of, of requirement on, on divestiture or, ac or acquisitions of your company or, bus or businesses or products. There should be some statement in here. Now here again, I, I try and I, I try to focus and have companies focus on doing that, which has a, has a relative functionary activity directive um, of, of, of employees of the company. So this is one of the general statements that needs to be made. 
but you need to, to, to make a line in the sand here that says if we sell a company that involves a, uh, a controlled product or we sell a company to a foreign company, uh, we recognize a need, and you identify that in two paragraphs or less. Uh, there needs to be a system that you audit that what you're doing, uh, that you make sure that your systems are working. So if they're not working, you readapt them, you revise them, you move forward. Um, also, if you have a situation where employees are not complying, that appropriate action is, is, is taken to ensure that those uh, employees are um, that um, are are brought to comply with U.S. laws and regulations. Uh, training. It's important here again that you provide specific training to employees. Um, you, sh you should treat them as as adults as intelligent adults and provide them uh, general information on U.S. export laws and regulations, um, a general knowledge of commodities that are controlled, technologies that are controlled that might be outside the parameters of what your company is engaged in, but give them a good overview of U.S. export laws and regulations as it relates to commodities and products and technology, and then also drill down on based upon those U.S. export laws and regulations, which you've provided them an overview on, drill down and provide them with elements of control that are, that are embedded in your export licensing and control policies and procedures and how they are expected to meet the company's, assist in the company meeting their compliance with U.S. export laws and regulations. Hey, Gary, we have one more question uh, related to the topic of export documentation. Do destination control statements, um, are they a requirement on documents to export control items as well as EAR 99 products? No, no, but here again, I recommend that the destination control statement be placed on everything. It can be, now, now it is much more easy than it, since, um, when is it, November 15th. Uh, in November 15th, uh, the destination control statement for both commerce and state was made the same. So now it really, really does lend itself to, to Im being embedded in your commercial invoice system, the menu to your system. Now, understanding that most companies, when they sell to U.S. companies, don't create a commercial invoice, they ship on a packing slip. So commercial invoices by m most every company I know, Commercial invoices are only created for export shipments. So in your form, in, in, in your form for your commercial invoice, have, you could even do it pre-printed, or you know, people don't pre-print anymore because they're online, but embed it in the, in the body of your commercial invoice, that destination control statement. It's, it's a standard statement for everyone. Now, there's, a, there's some personalization needs to be done, but that can be done if, if you have limited amount of of USML items, then you can do a, an amendment to it, uh, leave blanks on it, whatever. Uh, there is provisioning, but yes, no. The destination control statement is not required on on all export shipments. Only export control uh, sh uh, shipments. Uh, um, but here again, it's not required on EAR 99 items. But here again, it's recommended it be on everything. It just it makes it simpler, um, and you've got customs agents that enforce over 400 laws and regulations looking at the export shipments and some of them are very new on the, lo on the block and you could have a shipment held over until Monday by them saying there was no destination control statement and you're as right as rain, but it's Monday, you know? Thank okay. you, Harry. Okay, so uh, let's talk about foreign companies' responsibilities. You, you as a U.S. company have these U.S. export controls. Um, what, what does your foreign customer, your foreign vendor or supplier, what are their requirements? And here again, some real misunderstanding exists over these. If, if, the, if your, the US, your U.S. customer, your U.S. vendor and supplier is not owned or controlled by a U.S. company, that foreign company only has requirements with regards to compliance to U.S. laws and regulations in regards to items that they receive from the U.S. and the applicable restrictions that have been identified to them that are applicable to those items or to that technical data, information, or service that, that they obtain from the U.S. 
or technical data or items that they receive from other non-U.S. locations where a company in Belgium or a, a, uh, or a company in Germany or a company in, in, uh, in Ecuador provides them with some technical data or items and they identify to them that they're US, that it's U.S. technical data or it's U.S. items and there are applicable export restrictions and what those restrictions are. Now, if a foreign company receives something from, from uh, Ecuador and, and they tell them it's U.S. country of origin, uh, there, there are no restrictions from, by that foreign company. Uh, they're not obligated to go back and say, oh, this is U.S. origin, what are the restrictions? So, so that's the only obligation that a foreign company has. Now, if, if the foreign company um, is owned or controlled by a U.S. company, um, it's, it's a different story. They have to comply with U.S. sanction and boycotts. They have to do anything that the other foreign company that's not owned and controlled by a U.S. company has to do, but they have to do some other things. Um, they're, it's extraterr extraterritorial controls, yes, uh, but they have to comply with US, ex U.S. export sanctions and boycotts, and they have to comply with them doing business with, with um, um, sanctioned and boycotted companies and there's a greater level of expectation by the U.S. government that a foreign company that is owned by a U.S. company um, is compliant with U.S. laws and regulations uh, and the flow of, of related technical data and information. So you have to be a little bit better of a citizen, and, and you really are a sub-citizen uh, of the U.S. Uh, when you're a foreign company uh, and, you're and you are owned or controlled by a U.S. company. And even then, okay, so, and even then, so we have policies and procedures, they're, they're, they're good, they're concise, they're, they're discernible, our employees have been trained, we audit to find out um, if employees are complying, uh, we make sure that we amend them to make them better fit the way the, the company is currently operating. Um, we put in place the new changes and new regulations and, and and we strengthen and clarify and amend those controls. Um, and we retrain employees. Um, uh, errors can occur. And, and when those errors occur, um, it's, it's important that you respond to those uh, in a prompt, clear, and concise manner. Um, and the normal response when a violation occurs and a company has export controls in place in that invariably you're going to be relegated to do something to strengthen your controls. So the retort always by a U.S. company, by you, back to the U.S. government when a violation occurs is that you will be strengthening your controls and you're better served to find something to strengthen. Um, also the new mantra of the last several export compliance cases that we have handled, which is a little scary, is we are, we are handle having the U.S. government uh, make a query of one of their line items, has the employee that was responsible for that violation been terminated, um, which was never a case. It was always, has that employee been retrained? So regardless of how culpable the employee was, and even if you state that it was just a horrible error made by the employee, it was not done with intent, uh, they can get very demanding sometimes and and even make the inquiry whether that employee will be terminated or that employee will, will be removed from their responsibility so that future violations won't occur. Anyways, uh, thank you very much. And um, I had to skip over some things, but uh, I hope that's okay. And uh, if there's any questions, I, will, I am free to uh, respond as best I can. Thank you. Now you're ready to begin the Thank question. Thank you for your. Go ahead. I'm Paul. Just are you ready for the begin the question and answer session? Sure. Yes, we are. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one. You will be have to record your name. Again, just press star followed by one to ask a question. And one moment, please, for our first question.
Real quick, before we begin the audio questions, we have a written one for you, Gary. Do you need a technology control plan if you have products or services that are controlled by the EAR or ITAR? Um, you, you do not have to have them. You can include your technical data, because that really what that is, is controlling. You're really controlling technical data. And, and, and there's some appreciable product controls uh, that are the inferences to product controls also in the tech, in the technology control plan. They can also, they can all be inclusive in an export policy and procedure. There's no requirement that it be a separate document. I'm just saying that it's, you're better served uh, because when you get queried by um, 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 OEE, Office of Export Enforcement, with uh, Bureau of Industry and Security, or you get queried by uh, Director of Defense Trade Controls Compliance, they will ask you if relevant uh, to technical data uh, to supply your technical, uh, your, te uh, your, your TCP, your technology control plan. So it, it's, it's like painting by numbers. You're better served having a separate technology control plan. Outstanding, thank you. Operator, do we have any audio questions at this time? At this time, I'm showing no audio questions. Again, just press star followed by one to ask a question. And at this time, I'm showing no questions. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, Gary, for joining us for today's webinar on this important topic. Have a good afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, and this does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. And at this time, you may disconnect your lines.